Hi there, Smart Drivers. Rick with Smart Drive Test talking to you tonight about road signs, traffic signs, the signs along the roadway that give you information about the roadway, road rules, and keeping you safe and to help you pass a driver's test. Stick around. We'll be right back with that information. Hi there, Smart Drivers. Welcome back. A few people here already. Uh, Karina is here, you're most welcome. Pathfinder's here. Got the juice for life is here and recently passed his or her driver's test in the United States there. That's awesome. Which state did you pass your license in there, uh, Juice? Uh, Colin is here, got his G2 tomorrow in the province of Ontario here in Canada. That's autumn. Awesome. Katie S is here. And who else is here? Colin is here. Hello, my friend. Oh, Colin, yes, has his G2 tomorrow, uh, same person. So, Corey is here, Bricks for Wheels. Uh, Thanksgiving, uh, Thanksgiving, Colin was pretty low key. <laughs> Unfortunately, I have been sick for the last week uh, due to carpet I pulled out of a rental unit. So, uh, it hasn't, it's been pretty low key, yeah. Uh, Malika, hello, Tim is here, my friend Drive Smart BC, and Joseph is here from Toronto. So, quite a few people here. Uh, yeah, so unfortunately, if you watch the live stream from last week, I was definitely sick. <laughs> oh, man, was I sick. Uh, and that's what carpet does for you. I'm looking a little dark here, so I'm just going to just adjust the camera here. So just bear with me one sec. Okay, there we go. Just turn that up a little bit and save. There we go. Limitless is here. Tim from Winnipeg is here as well. And got the and juice. You passed your driver's license in the state of Georgia. That is peachy. And for those of you who don't know, <laughs> the nickname for Georgia is the Peach State, thus the little little pun there, <laughs> peachy. And my friend Margaret is here from New York, and uh, where I'm learning stuff from her, and she's learning stuff from us, and she's going to get her driver's license, everything's going to be awesome. Limitless is in California, brilliant. And somebody else I missed. DC is here from Ontario, Jacqueline's here as well. So basically the way that things work here is go through the presentation real quick, 12 to 15 minutes at the most, try to keep it short, and then we'll return at the uh, end of the presentation and we'll spend the remainder of the hour answering any questions you have about passing a driver's test and starting a career as a truck or bus driver if you're doing that as well. Excellent, Jacqueline, and happy we can help out. If you have any questions at all, Jacqueline, we'll do what we can to answer your questions for you. So we'll get going here on the presentation, uh, talking about traffic signs, road signs, and these are definitely broken into classifications. Uh, some you have to pay attention to, and if you don't pay attention to them and follow what's on the traffic sign for the purposes of a driver's test, you unfortunately will not be successful. Others will not, you know, will definitely keep you safe and may even, in fact, save your life if you don't, if you know what the, the traffic signs mean. So, for those of you who may be new to Smart Drive Test, my name is Rick August. Uh, I was a truck driver during the 1990s, hauling freight back and forth between the United States and Canada, uh, mostly east of the Mississippi. However, I did make it out to California and uh, other states a couple of times. And in 1997, I became a licensed commercial driving instructor. So, I've been a driving instructor for <laughs> longer than I like to think now. It's amazing how fast the years go by once you get a bit older. Uh, 2006, I graduated with my doctorate in legal history from the uh, University of Melbourne in Australia, and I looked at the transition between horse-drawn traffic and motor traffic and its impact on law and policing. During my time in Australia, I drove buses for Greyhound there, and if you want to know more, you can look at my autobiography over on the webpage. Uh, new video this week, uh, I moved out of Vernon, actually last week I went down to Vancouver Island. I uh, was doing some work there on my rental suite and on the way down uh, did some videos on merging uh, on the Trans-Canada Highway there in Vancouver in the outer suburbs. So uh, yeah, so have a look at that, uh, how to merge onto a freeway, quick, short and to the point. And basically the bottom line is do not stop on the on-ramp, get your foot into it, get going and launch your car. Road signs convey information in three ways, the shape of the sign, the color and the words or symbols written on the sign or there on the sign. So these are the ways. So we know that these signs here uh, with orange background and black lettering there on or symbols are construction signs. And we wanna know that these are temporary marking signs 
uh, for road crews that are doing construction and potentially you need to slow down in most of these areas uh, to keep yourself safe and other road users. There are road classification signs, regulatory signs, school signs, cautionary signs, lane control signs, and object marker signs. Uh, and Corey will put up the video for you on road sign classifications. Uh, and you can have a look at that and it will give you more detail than what I'm going to give you here. So have a look at that in terms of road classifications because essentially what you want to know or learn is that you can look at a traffic sign and at a glance glean the information from that sign so that you're going to stay safe on the on the roadway and as well you're going to be able to pass your driver's test if that is your goal at this moment is preparing for your driver's test. Now I'll tell you a story here uh, <laughs> some years ago uh, when I was in the province of Ontario and this was in preparation for me getting my license so this was around the late 1990s uh, I went to get my bus, my school bus license, and in Ontario, that is a different class of license. It's a Class B license. Most other places, you get it rolled into your bus license when you go to get your bus license. So, as part of getting my school bus license, I had to take a defensive driving course, and I thought, oh, no big deal. I've been driving a truck for five years, and uh, this crotchety old <laughs> driving instructor comes into the classroom. We're at uh, Fanshawe College in London, Ontario grabs a piece of chalk, scribbles on the board, and he says, name the four signs that warn you of hazards and obstructions on the roadway. And of course, like everyone else in the classroom, I was stumped. <laughs> Didn't know what they were. And he said, it's the four hash marks, the object marker signs. And uh, once I mention these two, you'll, you'll realize that they're absolutely everywhere on the roadways. They warn you of fixed objects on the roadway and on which side of the fixed objects to pass. So there's uh, yellow background they have hash marks on them they're rectangular signs and they can either point to the right point to the left or they can have a chevron on them which will tell you to pass that you can pass both on the left and the right and they're absolutely everywhere they're on the end of bridge abutments concrete um, traffic islands any obstruction that comes out into the roadway uh, bridge pillars that are down overpass pillars those types of things they'll be down there so object marker signs, and now that I've pointed these out to you, you'll know exactly where, you know, you'll just see these signs everywhere. Uh, the other one that the driving instructor, the crotchety old driving instructor was referring to was construction signs. So it was the object marker signs and the construction signs. So the object marker signs, most prolific on our roadways, pass left, right, or both sides. And these are especially important for those of you who might be driving larger vehicles or you're going to a different city or a different town. They will definitely keep you safe. And just one last point is, is that the way to know whether which side of the sign to pass on is, is imagine that you're taking a tea kettle and you pour water onto it. Whichever way the water runs off the hash marks is the side of the object that you pass on. Okay, so right, left, and or either left or right. So uh, know that for the purposes of object marker signs. All right, regulatory signs. These regulatory, the root word of regulatory is regulation. You must obey these. These are speed signs, stop signs, railway crossing signs. And for those of you driving larger vehicles, CDL vehicles, uh, brake check signs. You must stop at a, a, a pre-hill brake check sign and check your brakes before you descend the hill. So regulatory signs. And also know that these can be a little tricky. Uh, school, not school signs, uh, park signs, recreational signs. Sometimes we'll have, they have one person on them chasing a ball and underneath them they'll have a little regulatory sign that tells you that it's a speed limit of 30 kilometers an hour. Know that those, the, the regulatory sign supersedes the cautionary sign so it becomes a regulatory sign. So know that as well. Uh, cautionary signs uh, can be just about anything. I've seen cautionary signs for anything uh, from, you know, curve in the road, uh, advisory speed to the height, uh, telling for larger vehicles what the maximum height is, 11 feet, 8 inches. Uh, know that the maximum height for large commercial vehicles in Canada is 4.15 meters. Uh, for those of you in the States, it's 13 feet, 6 inches. Uh, some are relevant, some not so much. So it's it's one of those discretionary things when you're driving you need to take in have a look at the cautionary sign and then decide uh, whether that is information that is relevant to you or not for those of us driving passenger vehicles for example height signs are not relevant to us however uh, 
for commercial vehicles, height signs are very relevant to them. And this is something that you need to keep in mind uh, with, uh, you know, when you, when you begin to drive a CDL vehicle, a large commercial vehicle. And Tim just helped me out there with playground signs. Yes, that was what I was trying to say in, instead of park signs. They're playground signs with the little regulatory sign underneath them. Thank you, Tim. All right, so larger vehicles, It's once you begin to pull trailers, once you graduate to large pickup trucks or any type of commercial vehicle, it is incredibly important. <coughs> Excuse me. It's incredibly important that you begin to pay attention to destination signs, you begin to pay attention to overhead signs, and you match the speed of the flow of traffic. So if you can do that, keep up with the flow of traffic. As I say again and again, this keeps you more predictable on the roadways and reduces speed differentials, the difference in speed between your vehicle and other vehicles on the roadway and keeps you much more predictable. All right, so a couple of uh, other signs that you need to pay attention to are lane usage signs, uh, particularly if you're taking a driver's test, if you live in a city or a town or you're taking your test where there is a city or a town where they're gonna have two left turning lanes you want to be in the right turning lane. That way when you get around the corner on the left turn, you're gonna be in the right lane and you won't have to change lanes again. Okay, so larger vehicles, uh, these are overhead and need and are needed in the spring when road markings were worn off. And I've seen that here, particularly in Vernon. And as well, make sure that you're paying attention to those overhead signs because if you get into that lane and the examiner wants you to go straight, and you're in the left turning lane, well, you're gonna to have to turn left because you cannot disobey that sign. Again, it's a regulatory sign. It's, it's rectangular in shape, white background, black lettering. So it is a regulatory sign and you must obey it. And this is one that is overlooked by many people and it is a good defensive driving sign to take note of is mile marker signs. All of the state roads, all of the interstates in the US all have mile marker signs on them. We have them here in Canada on the Trans Canada as well. Not so much on the provincial roads, but we do have them. Uh, and the exit numbers are going to be the same as the mile markers, except in the state of New York, of course, because New York likes to be a little bit different. But take a bit of time when you're going on a trip or you're going on the interstate for whatever reason, uh, do a bit of planning and figure out exactly where which exit or which mile marker you're going to get on the freeway or interstate and which one you're going to get off because say for example that you're going to get off at exit 275 you know that when you get to exit 270 that you're going to need to be over in the right lane and within the next five miles you're going to be looking for your exit and you know exactly which exit you're going to be getting off at so it's going to keep you safe if you know what the mile markers uh, are and how to use them uh, to navigate and to drive defensively as opposed to you get up to your exit and you're like, oh my God, there's my exit. And you just like do, you know, off cutting people off and you're going over to your exit and those types of things. All right. So good luck on your driver's test. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. So get back over here and we'll answer any questions you have about passing a driver's test, staying safe on the roadway or starting a career as a truck or bus driver. Uh, <laughs> Tim says, I took bikes off a car roof in a parkade once. Height signs are important. Yes. <laughs> and you're not the only one, Tim, that has done that. Uh, I had some colleagues uh, years ago that had bicycles on the top of the car. Uh, they were going through a soccer field because they had the parking out on the soccer field or something and uh, he was driving and he decided that, oh, it'll be really cool to go underneath the goal net. Uh, in the soccer field <laughs> and she's screaming there's bicycles on the roof <laughs> so yes exactly that that height signs are important uh, especially as you say Tim if you're going into parkades or those types of things and for those of you living in Texas where everything is big and you've got your big you know or Calgary because it's cow town and everything's big you know and you got your 3500 Dodge Ram runaround truck and you're going into a parkade and it says maximum height of six feet, well, maybe your truck is way too big to get into that parkade, so as Tim says. So, uh, Jackson, Michigan, excellent. Hello, Michael, how are you? Uh, Colin, do I have any tips for my G2 so I can pass? Yes, I do. Uh, tips for your G2, okay, so uh, Colin, show up about a half an hour early, bring your identification, bring money, uh, make sure that you do a pre-trip inspection on your vehicle tonight. 
uh, make sure there's no lights out, those types of things, because when, when, when you start your test, they're gonna do a little mini pre-trip on your car. So they're gonna come out, they're gonna check, make sure that the license plate front and back and it's valid. They're gonna make sure that there's no cracks in the windshield. Uh, lights work, signals work, horn works. They're gonna check your brake lights. Uh, they're gonna get in the car, make sure there's no, you know, the, the foot wells aren't filled with fast food wrappers. Seat belt works on the passenger side, so make sure you do that. Even if you're going with the driving school, and this is for all the smart drivers out here, make sure that uh, you ask the driving instructor whether he or she did a pre-trip inspection on the car because, uh, and as well, no recording devices in the vehicle, no dash cams, okay, no cameras, no nothing, no recording devices. Uh, I had a student just last week, <coughs> excuse me, I had a smart driver last week denied his road test because he had a dash cam in the car and couldn't get it out. He said it was glued to the windshield, I guess. Uh, and, uh, you know, basically I would have found something to pry it off because it's not worth being denied your driver's test and then having to come back because you have a recording device in your vehicle. All right, so any driver's test, four components. Space management, speed management, observation, communication. Space management, don't get near anything. Uh, stay away from other road users and stay away from fixed objects. Uh, stopping positions at stop sign uh, controlled intersections, not just stop signs. Before the stop line, before the crosswalk or sidewalk, at the edge where the two roads meet. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. Uh, stop in traffic so you can see the tires of the vehicle in front making clear contact with the pavement. Two to three second following distance when you're following other traffic. Uh, what else do I need to tell you? Don't ever go into an intersection that you can't clear if the intersection is backed up. Uh, don't in enter the intersection. Stop on this side and wait for it to proceed. Speed management. Uh, speed uh, Posted speed limit or the flow of traffic, whichever is less. Communication. You have to communicate effectively with other traffic. Lights and signals. Horn, use your horn sparingly. Uh, it's seen as a sign of aggression in this day and age. Uh, hand gestures, make sure that you use all five fingers. Don't tell somebody else they're uh, <laughs> number one on a driver's test. Eye contact, if you're not sure. And then finally, the most important way that we communicate with other traffic is the position of your vehicle on the roadway. Uh, observation, you must have a scanning pattern in place. Every eight to 12 seconds down the road, uh, in, check your center mirror. Down, in, check your instrument panel. Far down the road, both shoulders. In, check your left wing mirror. Far down the road, both shoulders. Check your right wing mirror. Uh, two shoulder checks for every turn. Two shoulder checks for every time you change lanes. Uh, so basically, you're going to change lanes. Mirror signal, shoulder check. Turn your signal on. Shoulder check. Check again. Minimum three flashes on the signal. And then start moving over. Leave your signal on until you're completely in the other lane. Uh, backing up, make sure that you 360 degree scan, looking out the back window. If you have a backup camera, check that, check your mirrors. And then for the duration of backing up, you're going to be looking out the back window for every vehicle length that you're backing up. Stop, 360 degree scan, and then resume. All right. Uh, when you show up for your driver's test, make sure you back into the parking space unless signs prohibit you backing into the parking space. But that way you can be nice and calm. You don't have to back out into traffic when you get going. All right. Okay. Uh, <laughs> Farron, Corona. No, Lightning, it's not. It's it's disgusting carpet. We did. We pulled up the carpet in my rental unit. Everything that we, all the crap that was in the carpet went airborne. And that's what I've got. I don't, I, it's not Corona. <laughs> it's not Corona. Uh CJ, could you go over signaling and the proper procedures when entering a cul-de-sac? Uh, essentially, cul-de-sac, uh, CJ, you're going to signal because you're going to move the car to the right. Shoulder check, signal, and check your mirror. And then you're going to come around, and then you're going to signal to the left, okay? Mirror signal, shoulder check, around to the left. And then you just keep observing 360 degrees as you're going into the cul-de-sac and around the cul-de-sac. Uh, Krishnan, uh, tips for... Test in snowy conditions. Yes, uh, Corey, I'll put the video up for you on driver's test in the winter time. I've done that for you as well. That'll give you way more information. Uh, excellent. Essentially, uh, the driving test that uh, Juice did there in Georgia is the closed circuit test. There is a video here. Have a look at that as well.
Okay, we're back. Uh, Mercy, uh, thanks. I did uh, test it in Georgia, and I'm nervous. Did you test in a parking lot or on the road? Uh, Mercy, the test in Georgia is in a parking lot. Have a look at the video on COVID testing, closed circuit testing. Andrew, thanks to your videos, Rick. I passed the driver's test last Thursday. Uh, it sure made it a lot easier even I thought it would be. Excellent. Congratulations, Andrew, on passing your driver's test. Uh, where did you pass your driver's test? Excellent. Uh, Katie, I go too hard on the brakes. How do I get better at testing at braking? Uh, Katie, go back to the parking lot and get some cones, those one meter tall, three, 36 inch tall pylons or just some other pylons and just put it up at the end of the parking lot and just come down the parking lot as fast as you can get it going, 30, 40 miles an hour, and then just hammer those brakes on. Just hammer them on and then see what happens to the car. And then, you know, do that a couple of times, braking really hard, uh, and then circle around the cone. So come down, circle around the cone, and then try and brake and steer at the same time. See what response you get on the car. You know, and be aggressive on it. Then that way you're gonna feel what the brake is doing. And then as you get better at that and you do that a few times, then come down the parking lot, hit the brakes hard, and st come up, see how close you can get to the cone uh, when you're coming to a stop. And then finally, as you're coming down the parking lot, then try and brake gently, okay? But a, part of the mistake that we have in driver training is that a lot of driving instructors just go right over the slow speed maneuver part of teaching new drivers the car and, the, and, and teaching them how to drive. And they take them out of traffic and they do whatever they need to do to get them to pass a driver's test. And then and then students come back to me and they say, oh, I brake too hard, I, I can't control the throttle. Well, of course you can't because you haven't had any training in how to work the primary controls. You have to go to the parking lot and you have to be aggressive with the steering wheel. You have to be aggressive with the throttle. You have to be aggressive with the brake. If you don't know what it's, if you, if you, you spend the whole, your whole life just driving around in normal traffic, you're never gonna know what's gonna happen to that vehicle when you get into an emergency situation. So you need to do it aggressively to figure out the response of the vehicle. So that's what I, what I recommend to get better with the primary controls in your vehicle. Uh, Eric, uh, will New York City have a closed circuit road test too? <coughs> No, Eric, it's a shortened test there in New York City. They're not doing closed circuit test. Uh, Mohammed, how do I pass my driver's test first time? Mohammed, you go over to the Smart Drive Test website and pick up the Smarter Driver package, and that will guarantee that you pass your driver's test first time. If you don't pass first time, we'll give you your money back, and then we'll help you to make sure that you do pass. Okay, so that's how you do that. Tim, uh, good braking habits need good observation and anticipation so you don't have to do it suddenly. Yes, and that's awesome. Uh, after you come out of the parking lot, after you do the exercises to increase your mastery of the primary controls, then good braking comes with, as Tim said, good observation down the road, looking farther down the road, knowing when you have to brake and when you can just take your foot off the throttle. It's also tied in with good space management. If you can manage space around your vehicle and you have that three to four second following distance, then you're not going to have to aggressively brake because you can just let off the throttle, close up that space a little bit, and then regain your space and you're gonna be good on your observation and your braking, okay? Uh, Canada, how to control gas pedal? My speed keep, keeps going up. So Canada, what's happening? What's happening, Canada, is that you're not observing often enough. So your observation should be every eight to 12 seconds. You should be looking at your instrument panel. So if you're looking at your instrument panel, then uh, you'll know that you need, to, uh, you need to adjust more often. So that's why it keeps creeping up and creeping up and creeping up. Uh, Brett, uh, driving tips for Surrey, BC. Same thing as the driving tips that we had there previously, the four components of any driver's test, Brett. Uh, space management, speed management, observation, and communication, and those will help you with passing your test there in Surrey. Uh, doo -doo -doo. Juice, also in Georgia, the instructor is outside of the vehicle with a guardian in the vehicle. The guardian cannot tell you what to do. Doing so will result in an automatic fail. And then uh, adding on to what Juice said there about those of you doing closed circuit tests, 
uh, be sure that you bring your mentor with you to be in the vehicle for with you. Tim, have a great supper. Thanks so much for joining in. It's always a pleasure. CJ, uh, what are the examiners looking for specifically, especially uh, usually during the driver's test? All right, so CJ, what the examiner is looking for is, is that you have due care and control of the vehicle in changing traffic conditions. That's what he or she is looking for. That's it, that you are going to be safe <coughs> and understand the rules of the roadway while you're driving. That's all he or she is looking for. Okay, uh, Margaret, have to wait till the 23rd of November to take my permit test. Is there any online driving simulator you recommend to practice before I can start driving lessons? Margaret, are you looking for online practice driving tests or are you looking for some sort of simulation for driving the vehicle? Uh, yeah, because that's a real kind of a pain that you have to wait until the 23rd to get your permit. Uh, Andrew, passed in Finley, Ohio. It was a closed circuit course from the time From the time your test starts to the end, along with the inspection of the cars, maybe six to seven minutes at most. Yeah, they're not very long at this juncture right now, Andrew, for sure. Thanks for that information. <laughs> Lightning, let's hope it's not Corona or else we probably have to start saying our goodbyes. No, Ferret, I'm not going anywhere. Cheeky bugger. <laughs> uh, tips for drivers in Newton, BC. So, Brett, uh, same thing, four components of passing a driver's test, observation, communication, speed management, and space management. Just back the video up there a little bit, and I went over that and have a look at that. Um, Brent, uh, thank you. been watching your videos for a while now. You're a lot of help. Yes, we really try to help and be of service and get you your driver's license so you can get on the road to driving well. Uh, Katie, I had to slam on the brakes when I had my uncle and my mom in the car. I had the right of way and the UPS truck turned in front of me. I had to slam on the brakes to avoid a crash. It was scary. Yeah, Katie, it's going to be scary for sure. No doubt. Okay. But just, uh, as Tim mentioned, just, you know, start looking farther down the road and in <laughs> what I say as well, don't trust other vehicles, especially UPS vehicles and taxi cabs. Those people are crazy. They're just, they're going, they're busy. And they don't always do the observation that they should be doing. Uh, Muhammad, how much should I pay driving instructor if I have to use his car for the driver's test? Uh, Muhammad, that's really up to the individual driving schools. I'm really not uh, familiar with what different places are going to cost in terms of their fees and those types of things. Uh, Margaret, I can't start driving lessons until I get my permit. Yes, and that's unfortunate. I do know that there are some states and maybe some of the smart drivers can uh, leave a comment down in the comment section there about some of the states are now doing online drivers testing for the permits. I mean, it's been really slow coming. This should have been happening a long time ago. Okay. Uh, there is a backlog in New York because of the COVID and so tw 23rd of November was the earliest day I could get. I wanted to get it online practice before I actually get in a car like a simulator program. Uh, Margaret, I didn't tell you to do this, but if you've got a mentor or somebody that you can drive with, you're, there's, you could probably go and practice in a parking lot with some pylons. You didn't hear me say that, but that, that would be my thing is that just go and practice in a parking lot. Uh, nobody's going to give you any grief about that. Okay. Uh, Dixon, apples or oranges? <laughs> I don't know which one. I'm an app, more of an apple person. Uh, blackout, uh, how is it going? Uh, I got a road test book for the 29th of October. Any pointers, any tips? Practice, practice, practice. And one, the other thing, Blackout, that I would suggest to you are, um, sorry, Jacob. The other thing I would suggest is to go back and revisit the fundamentals. So go get some of those one meter tall, three, 36 inch tall pylons and work in a parking lot. Do some exercises there and just revisit that so that you have a really high mastery of the primary controls and you also know exactly where your vehicle is in space and place. And, you know, it's amazing. Again, I said this before about the number of students who are not taught, are not taken to a parking lot, to work in a parking lot, to do these fundamental driving skills. I look at the number of cars as I'm walking down the road because that's what I do. That's my life. 
and I look at the wheels and the rims and how many people scrub the curbs on their car. And the reason they're scrubbing the, 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 the rims and the wheels on their car when they're parking along the curb is because they've never taken the time to do these fundamental exercises in the parking lot, learning where their vehicle is in space and place, and do, doing mastery of the primary controls. Because there is, you should, as a driver, you should be able to part, pull in beside the curb and not scrub the curb with the tires. And I'll tell you right now, from a kind of a professional point of view, if I see a car and it's got white walls and it's all scrubbed up because somebody keeps rubbing the curb, that just makes you a bad driver. So take the time, go to the parking lot, do the fundamentals, and learn mastery of the primary controls and learn where your vehicle is in space and place. Oh, excuse me. Just talking is really irritating whatever dust is in my throat. I was told today that I was supposed to drink a lot of milk and that'll help soothe all the dust and whatnot, so whatever's, in my, whatever's in my throat. Uh, uh, Sahel, how can we drive to help minimize traffic? How can you drive? Uh, I'm not sure I'm understanding the question, but one of the ways that you can deal with traffic is by managing space around your vehicle. And you can always manage space in front of your vehicle. You should always have that three to four second following distance in front of your vehicle. That's going to keep you safe. And Corey will put the video up for you on space management. Have a look at that video and that will, that will teach you how to manage space around your vehicle and keep that smart buffer of space around your vehicle. Uh, blackout appreciate your feedback thank you for getting back to me no worries uh, Catherine uh, yours is next Monday excellent uh, Bobby how you doing uh, mercy good luck Jew I have a question I currently live in BC I still do not know how much speed uh, residential when there's a lot of parked cars uh, Jew you can slow down it's 50 kilometers an hour if you look at the video here on uh, passing a driver's test You'll see that when I'm in the residential area, I'm not ever doing 50 kilometers an hour. I'm probably doing, you know, 35, 40, 45 kilometers an hour at the most. So you can slow down when there's parked cars, but it's going to need, you know, it's 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 a discretionary thing. It's going to depend on how much, uh, you know, how many parked cars and those types of things. But don't slow down too much, okay? Uh, Margaret, you need a humidifier and air purifier that will get rid of the cough. Yeah, Margaret, it was just, oh. Uh, I don't even want to tell you how nasty that carpet was we pulled out, but <laughs> just oh, I I didn't even didn't even think I've done resident so much residential work and just, you know demolition of properties before and never had this happen and wow yeah it was something else. Uh, Jude, thanks so much. Uh, BT, hello from Kelowna. Hello, hello, hello. Uh, Justin, hello. Uh, Bobby, any advice on a reverse stall park for the smart car? Asking for a friend. For a smart car, <laughs> uh, Bobby, get it in between the lines. Uh, it's a it's a smart car. It it's not that big. Uh, yeah, it's kind of like parking a tissue. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Uh, despite the size of the smart car, Bobby, uh, it's all the same procedures as everything else. You're gonna back into the space. Uh, you know, you're gonna pull up. You're gonna signal where you're gonna go. And you know, you're gonna do your 360 degree scans and then you're gonna look out the back window, same as any other vehicle. It's not gonna determine, you know, whether you're driving a smart car or not. But anyway, uh, all punning aside on a smart car and you know, smart drivers, it's the same procedure as it would be for a normal car. Uh, BT, I had my uh, driver's test on the 12th of November, watched all your videos, it's so helpful. Thank you, you're most welcome, my friend. Esteban, uh, do you recommend to rent a car for the test? Uh, Esteban, it depends what kind of personal vehicle that you have for the driver's test. If you have a big 2500 Dodge Ram and, you know, I would recommend that you rent a car, you hire a car through a local driving school to take your driver's test. Uh, blackout, uh, Jacob, I've 
practiced lots and lots until now, had my learners for months and months. I attempted my first road test. I took it. It was unsuccessful, unfortunately. Uh, this will be my second attempt. Awesome. So that's really great. So Jacob, you're going to be fine. You're going to do great. And uh, just think of it as, you know, first attempt in learning. That's what fail means, right? Uh, Jacqueline, Rick, it's nice of you for all this info. Always helpful. And so glad that we can help out, Jacqueline. Uh, if you have any questions at all, drop us a note. Uh, Sahil, thanks for answering my question. Another thing I'm having trouble with is how I can communicate with other drivers at a four-way intersection to see if they're yielding the right of way. Uh, Sahil, uh, have a look at the video on how to handle four-way stops. The other thing I would suggest to you, Sahil, is you can't really communicate. There's a culture and rules that govern how you proceed through four-way stops. Four-way stop signed intersections, rather. So what I would suggest to you is just go down to the four-way stop sign intersection when it's busy and stand there for 20 minutes and just watch how the traffic proceeds through the intersection. I know that's kind of goofy, but it's the best way to learn without actually being in a vehicle and being under pressure to go or not to go at a four-way uh, stop sign intersection. That's what I would suggest to you uh, what you're doing. Anaheim, hope you're having a wonderful day. I am having a wonderful day. Uh, Amer it's Canadian Thanksgiving here uh, in our country. Uh, Big Mac Sam, hello my friend. How are you uh, there in uh, New York? Awesome. Yeah, don't scrub your tires. Yeah, it just it looks amateur. Absolutely. Uh, epic. American Canadian road signs are exactly the same because they use the same uh, it's it's according to a standard. However, in Europe and uh, Asia, Vienna convention style traffic signs are used. Give way means uh, U.S. Canadian yield signs. Yeah, they're you know road signs are more or less standard as Epic says. Uh, they're definitely uh, consistent in the United States, but they're so consistent they're consistent enough in Europe and other parts of the world that it's pretty easy to understand them and pretty easy to get on board with the information that those traffic signs are conveying. Uh, definitely, so that's what's going on there. Uh, Sam says he likes Toyotas or Hondas for first cars, and I tend to agree with Sam on that. Uh, there are other vehicles out there, definitely Nissans, you know, Chevys, Dodges, all of those. Uh, but, you know, for a first vehicle, I mean, I have a 1998 Honda CRV that's got 340,000 kilometers on it, but it's about 208,000 miles on it. So it's it's a good vehicle, okay? Uh, Marine, uh, my dad's car got the car side collision feature where it warning you of sideways mirrors. Okay, so you have blind spot detectors. Uh, no, Marine, you still have to shoulder check. And even if you have those on your vehicle, blind spot detectors uh, blind spot detectors you still have to shoulder check so as long as you're shoulder checking for the purposes of your driver's test you're gonna be fine you don't have to worry about turning off your blind spot detectors uh, Sam you're great awesome yeah well other than a bit of a cough Sam <laughs> it's from demolishing houses and pulling out all gross carpet I think my mom had the best analogy about carpet. She said, carpet's like throwing your coat on the floor for six months and walking on it. And then after six months, putting it on and wearing it. She said, that's kind of what carpet is. <laughs> I, I tended to agree with her, especially I've been deathly ill this week for pulling up old carpet. Uh, Katie sa uh, Kate says that uh, Mazda is a good first car as well. And uh, the other thing, we, you know, if any of you are contemplating buying your new first new vehicle and those types of things, and uh, Hyundai's, I've heard good news, you know, good information about Hyundai's as well. Uh, just go online and do reviews. Look up reviews of the vehicle that you're thinking about buying. There's so much information now that you can Google about your first vehicle and those types of things. And if there is something wrong with it, you can learn what that is fairly quickly. And then you can decide, you know, okay, so if you buy a five-speed Mazda, for example, and you learn that after 150,000 miles, the clutch goes out of it and, and the car's got 130,000 miles on it, are you prepared to put a clutch in it another 20,000 miles? Is that something you can deal with? Or, for example, uh, the Honda CRVs that I have, that, that vintage of Honda, you had to change the timing belt every... 
hundred thousand, eighty thousand, a hundred thousand kilometers because, or I think no, sorry, hundred forty thousand kilometers. You had to change the timing belt. The timing timing belt's about a thousand dollar job because if it breaks, it's called what's an interference motor is is that you'll do damage to the top end of the motor. Simplistically speaking, so you know whatever vehicle you're thinking about buying as your first vehicle, simply go online, Google it, have a look, and see if you are prepared to do whatever repairs that you need to do. And as well, know that cars cost money and they have to be maintained. There's regular maintenance on top of your insurance and you know the cost of putting fuel in it and those types of things. They need new tires, they need suspension work, they need new windshield wipers, uh, you know, all the other thing that goes along with owning a vehicle. So just know that, okay? Excellent. Uh, Am I pass my driver's test? That's awesome. Congratulations on passing your driver's test. Uh, that is brilliant. Justin, thank you so much for the super chat there. That is awesome. And uh, always, always welcome with the super chats. Uh, Bobby, my car is a 2000 Toyota Camry. I think it's a good first car. Uh, Bobby, I would tend to agree with you on that. As uh, my friend Sam said, Big Mac Sam there in New York, Toyotas, Hondas, they're great first vehicles. So, uh, you know, as I said, it's what I have. And uh, yeah, okay. Esteban, is leasing a good decision for a first car? Uh, Esteban, I don't know whether leasing is the, is, the, is the deal that it once was, okay? I know that if you own a business, yes, leasing is potentially a viable option. But if you're just having a first car and you just wanna have a first car, I don't think that leasing is going to be your best option. I think that for a first vehicle, and this is what I recommend to all new drivers, especially if you're young, if you're under 25 years old and you're getting your first vehicle, is to buy an older vehicle, buy it outright, and that way your insurance is going to be less because you simply want to have property damage and public liability on the car. You want to have the minimum insurance as possible. And understand that if you lease a vehicle or if you have financing on a vehicle, you have to put collision on your vehicle. So I'll just back up here again. So the types of insurance are PL and PD, which is public is property damage and public liability. So public liability is, is if you crash into somebody and they suffer a brain injury and they sue you, that's public liability. So property damage, public liability, you have to have those two types of insurance. The optional insurances on a car are theft, fire, and collision, okay? If you get financing on a car, you automatically have to get uh, collision on the vehicle. Essentially what that means is if you drive down the road and you go off the road and hit a hydro pole and you demolish that car, then collision will pay for it because it was your fault, not somebody else's. So what I see, so as, as soon as you put financing on a vehicle or you put leasing on a vehicle, you have to have a collision. And as soon as you put collision on your vehicle, your insurance doubles. So for example, I have public liability property damage on my Honda CRV. If I put collision on that, my insurance would go from $1,000 a year to $2,000 a year. So know that. And for a lot of you young people, sorry, a lot of smart drivers who are younger, it's your your insurance is already going to be exorbitant. It's going to be incredibly almost out of reach. So so know that for the purposes of buying a car. So what I recommend to get cheaper insurance, buy an older car, buy it outright, and then that way just put PL and PD on your car for insurance. Tim, <laughs> just want to remind everyone to download the Canada's Safest Driver app and join the contest. There are some nice prizes. Oh, I wasn't even aware of that. Awesome. Uh, Tim, I'll definitely have a look at that. And yes, so for all the uh, Canadian drivers out there, uh, Canada's, Canada's safer, safest driver app. We'll have to have a look for that. Uh, Rocket Man, just got my CDL A today. Thanks for all the helpful information. You're most welcome. That's awesome. Uh, Rocket Man, do you have a, a job lined up as of yet for your CDL license there? And Sam says, I agree. Buy a vehicle outright for your first car. Excellent. Uh, Matt, I have my N road test tomorrow morning in Penticton. What if I get the turkey farts while doing my road test? Uh, I'm not even going to answer that. That's just too funny. Alpha, hey, Rick, can international students get class one BC license? Uh, 
Alpha, I'm not sure whether you would be able to work that out. If you're already in the country, you may be able to do that. Uh, Marine, I'm looking at a used Infinity car. I saw one with 200,000 miles on it. Uh, Marine, yeah, do your research. Go on the internet, have a look, and those types of things. And also, remember, uh, have a look. at. There's a couple of videos here. Corey will put those up for you on purchasing a used vehicle. Just remember, every vehicle tells a story. <laughs> And you can go in and, you know, there's a video here I did and I was looking at a secondhand vehicle, you know, and I went out and it was still kind of spring and there was a bit of ice around and those types of things. The tires were bald. We can live with tires. Remember, tires are a negotiating factor, okay? Because if the tires are bald, you can say to the person that you're negotiating the price of the vehicle with, uh, okay, new tires are 800 bucks. So you take 800 bucks off the price. It's a negotiating factor. It's a known thing. The reverse lights on the vehicle weren't working. That's not a known thing because to fix reverse lights on a secondhand car, it could be anything from a blown fuse to a break in the wire somewhere and it could take you from anywhere from 10 minutes to 10 days to fix that. So if that's the kind of vehicle you got something like that, stay away from it. That's my recommendation. Just stay away from that vehicle. Uh, so figure out what you can or cannot do. Here's another example. Uh, I had a friend of mine who I just helped her out to put tires on her vehicle. She bought a 2018 Volkswagen. Bought it from the Lexus dealer. The tires, the all-season tires that it came with, were bald. Okay, so it didn't have any tires on it. The winter tires, I looked at the winter tires. They were questionable about the amount of tread on them. I took them into the tire shop to my friend Gary, who there's another video up here. Corey, I'll put that up for you. And the date on the tires, the tire, the winter tires were 10 years old. Tires have an eight year shelf life. They're only good for eight years. So make sure you figure out when you're looking at the tires on the vehicle, what is the date that the tires were manufactured? If they're older than eight years, then that's another negotiating port point for you in terms of buying a vehicle because you now got to put tires on it. And what happened with my friend and the 2018 Volkswagen was is that she ended up being out two thousand dollars because it didn't come with a set of seasonal tires and it didn't come with a set of winter tires she didn't get any tires basically there was enough tread on the on the all season tires for the summer and now once fall came then she had to put brand new tires on it so know that the tires are your biggest thing that you need to really be looking at when you're purchasing a secondhand vehicle and it's not just how much tread is on whether the tires are down to the wear bars but it's also how old the tires are. And the tires have a shelf life of eight years. If you're driving around with tires older than eight years, the vehicle's not safe, okay? And don't compromise on tires. It's the only thing between you and the road, <laughs> okay? So know that. Uh, James, hey, Rick, I got my driving permit, but I have a quick question. Should I let a friend or a family member show me how to drive or should I just pay a driving instructor? Uh, James, it kind of depends, you know, how you're, what your aptitude and what your how comfortable you are driving the vehicle. If you're fairly comfortable at, you know, going on here on Smart Drive Test and, you know, looking at the videos and then going out and practicing with a mentor, then by all means, go and do it. Uh, the other option, uh, James, is you could go over to the Smart Drive Test website and pick up past your driver's test first time. All the lessons in there, you know, it's kind of a six week program. Uh, you could follow along in that and have somebody with you that would just go through those lessons with you and help you out and learn how to drive. Uh, that's another option for you. But it really depends on your own comfort level, level with driving and how well you can drive and those types of things about whether you want, actually want to get in the vehicle with a driving instructor. So those are a couple of options for you. Okay, uh, Sheldon, I love your videos. I learned so much. Thank you so much, Sheldon. That's awesome. Thank you, my friend. Uh, Tim, in BC, it is illegal to deliver over to a purchaser a vehicle that is not proper to use on the highway. The only way around it is to note that the vehicle is not suitable on the bill of sale. Yeah, and Tim, essentially what it was is the all-season tires had simply enough tread on them that the vehicle could go out the door. But again, uh, you know, it was just one of those oversights. <laughs> I tried to convince her to let me have a look at the vehicle, and the winter tires came back. And as soon as I took them to the tire shop, they're like, these are 10 years old. I'm like, yeah. Yeah, I thought so. Uh, DC is buying a car with high mileage, a good idea, 450K on an 03 Camry for $5,000. Uh, DC, again, I would be looking up the reviews online. Uh, you know, 
450,000 kilometers on an 03 Camry for five grand, that seems a little high to me. Uh, I mean, one of the ways DC that you can figure that out, and this goes for everybody else, is that looking is, is looking for a vehicle. If you're trying to figure out what a comparable price is, go on Auto Trader and then just type in the model year and make model of the vehicle and see what comes up and see what the price is. Personally, I think that a 450,000 kilometers on an 03 Camry is a bit is a is pretty high. Uh, I I personally think that that a vehicle with that kind of mileage on it should be more kind of 2,500, 3,000 dollars because 450,000 kilometers that's a lot. That's a really really high number of kilometers. Okay. Uh, Harmony, uh, what do you do on the road if you get tailgated by another car? Okay, so Harmony, great question, and you definitely don't want to get rear-ended while you're driving on the roadway, uh, is to increase the space in front of your vehicle because now you're driving for yourself and the goofball behind you. And if you're on a multi-lane road, then just slow down and let them go around you. But if, you, if you're on a single-lane road and they're tailgating you and you're driving the speed limit, then just increase your distance in front of your vehicle until they pass you. And that's basically what you can do. Be, and look farther down the road because now you're driving both your vehicle and you're driving the vehicle of the goofy person who, who, behind you who's insisting on tailgating you. Okay? Uh, but, but, but who else? Um, yeah, so okay. And as well, make sure that you have a look over at the Smart Drive Test website. Uh, great questions over there. Air brake practice driving test questions. CDL practice driving test questions. Uh, I've been working a lot on the website of late and putting a lot of energy into that to get that up and helping more people as well. And uh, Corey's put up a lot of good information here for new drivers and those types of things as well. Uh, DC, you're most welcome in terms of uh, your first vehicle. And again, uh, for all of you, uh, for all the smart drivers out there who are younger than 25 and you've got to buy your first vehicle, uh, you know, it's, it's expensive. These, these goofy things are expensive. There's no doubt about it. Uh, and uh, so know that and you want, as, as Sam and I said, you want to buy your first vehicle outright. So save up two or $3,000, buy it outright, don't have financing on it. And then that way you can just put the basic insurance on and that's going to keep your insurance down. Uh, the other thing that you may need to do in order to put, keep your insurance even lower <coughs> is you know have your give your parents the money have your parents buy the car and then you're just on as a secondary driver on the vehicle and that way you can get some experience uh before you go out and buy your own vehicle because insurance is expensive and it really is the barrier to owning your first vehicle okay uh khalifa uh what do you do if your examiner tells you to drive 45 on a uh that has a 45 kilometer uh bernard is that an experience that you had because uh that is simply something that a driving examiner, in my experience, would not do. They would not tell you to drive 45 on a 40 kilometer an hour speed limit roadway. Uh, I just can't see them ever doing that. Uh, Tim, uh, pull over and stop. Let the idiot buy. <laughs> Your safety is worth more than the time that it takes. Yeah, that's definitely another option. Uh, if somebody is insisting on tailgating you for a long period of time, uh, then just pull over on the side of the road, as Tim said, and let them go by you. Esteban uh, from Argentina, thank you for your help. You are most welcome, my friend. Uh, so glad that we can help people out here and get their license, keep them safe on the on the roadway and those types of things. Oh, and the other thing that I did was I put up a PDF sheet, a checklist uh, for driving a manual car. You've noticed uh, on the community tab, maybe or maybe you did or maybe you didn't, that I've been putting up some information about driving a manual car. I did create a PDF for those of you learning to drive a manual car and it kind of goes through the main the 10 main things that you need to keep in mind or consider when you're driving a manual car and uh, uh, I'm trying to think I'll, I'll what I'll do is I'll post it I it's on the community tab go to the community tab and look up that and uh, you'll find that there and you can get that checklist uh, over at the smart drive test website. Uh, Emma, what should you do if the examiner tells you to parallel park in front of a driveway then marks it as my fault? Is that something that happened to you, Emma? Because, I mean, it it has uh, uh, it has happened, but it doesn't happen very often that they get you to park in front of a driveway. That's just not something that they do. Uh, Bernard, where are you in the world that a driving examiner told you to drive faster than the speed limit? 
Are you are you absolutely positive that that was the posted speed limit was 40 kilometers an hour? Uh, I I because I I just find that hard to believe, and it, it's just it's the reason I find it hard to believe is because it's one of the golden rules of being a driving examiner. You cannot ask a student to do anything that is illegal. And that's, that's why I'm a little bit incredulous. Uh, so that's, that's why I'm asking to clarify that. Uh, Tim, thanks for doing this. Uh, good night. Thank you, my friend. All the best. And, uh, and we'll definitely look at that app that you put down there. Uh, definitely, I'll post that on the community tab or whatnot. Okay. Uh, Maria, that's odd. Uh, yeah, it's, you know, because that is, the, you know, most of the time driving examiners are immu immune from, like, they have a lot of discretion in their job that they do and when they're, you know, determining whether a student is safe to drive or not. But, and, you know, they just would not open themselves up to having something that can come at them and asking a student to do something illegal such as driving faster than the posted speed limit is something that will open them up to criticism and open them up to being reprimanded uh so that's again this is what, what what's going on uh okay emma it did unfortunately however i did pass my driver's test and i want to thank you for all your advice i will continue to keep up Okay, so even though the driving examiner asked you to do that, Emma, you still managed to pass your driver's test. Uh, well, congratulations on that. That's awesome. And if you did parallel park in front of a driveway, even more kudos to you because that's tough. That's really tough. Parking in front of a driveway is tough because, I mean, not only you're like, oh my God, am I going to be able to park in front of a driveway and there's no curb there. Uh, you're also like, oh my God, is the vehicle going to pull up that pulls into the driveway or those types of things. Uh, because the video I did with parallel parking on the left side of the roadway, uh, that's what happened. I was parallel parking in the car came down the road, and drove into the driveway that was just like just behind me. So, you know, it's a little bit of, <laughs> oh, what's going on and where are the other cars and what's what's happening here? So if you were able to do that uh, on your driver's test, that's really awesome that you were able to do that. Congratulations. Uh, Harmony, thank you for the advice. You're most welcome. Catherine, you're most welcome. And I think we'll leave it there for tonight. Uh, you know, still stuffed up. <laughs> and uh, if anybody has any questions at all, uh, leave me a comment down in the comment section. Send me an email, rick at smartdrivetest.com. We'll definitely help you out. Uh, before you head out, hit that thumbs up button and uh, hit that bell. And that way you'll get notifications and uh, lots of good stuff coming here. And uh, we get new videos up every Wednesday at 4 p.m. So have a look for all of that. Bernard, this happened during my G driving test in Burlington. It threw me off quite a bit as he asked me to drive faster on both the 40 and 60 kilometer an hour roads. Uh, Bernard, that is very unfortunate. Very unfortunate. I'm sorry to hear that. And I'm, I'm actually surprised to hear that, that a driving examiner uh, would have asked you to exceed the posted speed limit. And I'm uh, that is something that you could launch a formal complaint around. There isn't a whole lot that I would ever encourage smart drivers to launch a complaint, but that is something that I would uh, encourage you to launch a complaint about, that if the driving examiner is asking you to exceed the posted speed limit on a driving test, that's that's simply not right, okay? Uh, Maria, thank you, Rick, for all your videos. You rock. Thank you so much. Thank you, Michael. And uh, Corey put up the video there on how to parallel park on the left side. So yeah, so we're going to leave it there for tonight. Again, hit that thumbs up button and uh, leave us a comment down in the comment section there if you're watching on the replay. And uh, if you have a driving test come up this week, uh, good luck on that. And remember, pick the best answer, not necessarily the right answer. Have a great night. All the best. Bye now.